And sometimes we also say Shalom Aleichem, which is a greeting of peace to you all uh, that is said traditionally. Uh, and then the response is peace to all of me. Uh, grammatically, it's not correct, but it's the way it's been done uh, for a long time. If you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, uh, we call it tradition. And uh, once we start those traditions, it's pretty hard to change them. So, um, but it's always good to uh, wish one another peace. And actually, the Hebrew word uh, shalom involves more than peace. It really uh, has the idea of wholeness and restoration. And we are living in a day uh, where we need not only peace, but we also need restoration. Um, and we are glad to have you with us tonight as a Messianic Jewish congregation. Uh, we are here to uh, emphasize the Jewishness of the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. Uh, that's why we call him by his uh, Hebrew name. We also emphasize the Jewishness of our new covenant faith. And uh, I trust that the service uh, will be a blessing to you. My name is Rabbi Todd Lesser. I am the congregational leader, uh, and we uh, are glad to have you with us this evening. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, trying to provide hope and encouragement uh, no matter what is going on uh, in the world because the Sabbath is a weekly divine appointment that the Lord has established uh, as we try to um, just put aside uh, all the, the noise and the activity uh, of the past week, the noise of the world that we might be able to focus completely uh, on our God and his eternal truth. So we uh, are blessed to have you with us and um, we are going to inaugurate our service in the traditional way and that's with the lighting of the Sabbath candle. So at this time I'm going to ask Liz Klingensmith uh, to usher in the Sabbath for us and you will note that there are two candles uh, which is frequently the case by tradition because we are given two instructions in the scripture uh, in the Hebrew, we are to Zahur, to remember the Sabbath, and we are to Shomer, to keep or guard the Sabbath. <clears throat> Thank you, Liz. And now I'm going to call up our cantor for the evening, Fred Scott, and ask you to please stand uh, for the prayer known as the Shema. This prayer is actually uh, taken uh, or found in this week based on a verse, uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, that is found in this week's portion. So we will be talking about it uh, even more. But in this prayer, uh, as a community, we affirm the oneness, uh, the uniqueness of our God. Yeshua referred to the first line of the Shema as the greatest commandment. We'll chant the prayer in Hebrew, then recite the English translation, and we will follow that uh, with reciting the uh, Via Hafta, which are the verses that follow in Deuteronomy 6. Uh, we'll recite it in the Hebrew and then in the English. Together, the Shema. Shema Yisrael, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever. And now the Via Hafta. 
Viahavta et Adonai Elohecha, Vakal Lavavka, Uvakal Nashaka, Uvakal Miadecha, Vahayu Hadvarim Haele, Asher Anochi Mitzavka Hayom Alavavecha, Vishinantam Livanecha, Vidibar Tabam, Vishivtaka Bavetecha, Uvlechtaka Baderech, Ushach Baka Uvkumecha, Ukshartam Leot Al Yadecha, Vahayu Le Totofot Bain Enecha, Uktav Tam Al Mazuzot Betecha, Uvisha Arecha, Viahavta Larecha, Kamoka, Amen. And translation And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontless between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Please join me as we open our service in prayer. Eloheinu velohavotenu, Eloheavraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together, Lord, on this weekly divine appointment that you have established. Uh, something that many of us have done week after week after week. And uh, until this pandemic, we did not realize, perhaps, Lord, what a blessing it is uh, to be able to come together to offer up our, our community sacrifice of praise and worship uh, unto the creator of the universe. And, Lord, we pray your blessing on this service. We pray that you would bless each one who is here, each one who is watching by video. And, Lord, we pray your protective covering. Uh, that your, your angels would just watch over us and keep this uh, plague, this pandemic away from each one who is here, from those uh, who are not able to be here for whatever reason. And Lord, if they are, are uh, suffering um, it, uh, sickness that causes them to not be able to be here, Lord, that you would raise them up from the bed, bed of affliction. And Lord, we just ask you to uh, use these times, Lord, to draw your people back to you to draw the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, uh, back to their uh, creator, the Holy One of Israel, uh, the Redeemer of Israel. And Lord, for all who have called upon the name of Messiah Yeshua, Lord, uh, many may have gone astray, but you are able, Lord, to woo them back, to bring them back, Lord, uh, as we all desire uh, perfect, intimate fellowship with our creator. And Lord, we pray that any efforts of the adversary during this time uh, would be for naught, Lord, that they would uh, result in glory to you in ways that uh, he has not anticipated. And Lord, we just ask your anointing on the singing, on the dancing, the worship, the praise, the message, the liturgy, the fellowship, every aspect of the service. Lord, we dedicate it to you and we believe that you are able to use it for your purposes and your glory. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. Now we are going to uh, chant a traditional prayer that uh, we began incorporating into our service uh, when we had to um, stop in a, uh, being able to have uh, public meetings. Uh, it's called the Vishamru, uh, which we have kept in our service at this point, which means, and they shall keep. Uh, the prayer is uh, taken from Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. Uh, we'll chant the prayer in Hebrew uh, and then recite the English translation with a messianic paragraph that we have added at the end. Together, the Vishamru. Vishamru, the Israel, et hashabat, la'asod et hashabat, le'dorat ambarid olam. Vishamru,
children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat to observe it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. And we know our Messiah Yeshua observed the Shabbat. In the New Covenant Scriptures we are told, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Amen. Now we are going to enter into the scripture portion of our service, and I will call forward our ARC opener, Carl Twain, uh, and also uh, Neil Bowling, uh, who will be leading us in this portion of our service. And we would ask you to please stand as the ARC is opened. The Ark is the tra uh, traditional name for the furniture that houses the scroll, known as the Torah, uh, which contains the first five books of the Bible, known as the five books of Moses. Shabbat shalom. And it came to pass, whenever the ark went forward, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. May those who hate you flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unique is our God, great is our Lord, holy and revered is his name. Magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Yours, Yours O Lord, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. And you are exalted as head over all. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mount. For the Lord our God is holy. We'll now ask our scripture readers to come forward. He who blessed our fathers, Avraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May he bless Brian, son of Yeshua, and Rosalie, daughter of Yeshua, who have come up to honor God and his word. May the Holy One bless them and their families and send blessing and prosperity on all the work of their hands. Amen. And now for the blessing before the reading of the Torah. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Bless the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Baruch atah Adonai, notein ha-Torah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. 
This is the eleventh day of the fifth month on the Hebrew calendar, the month of Av. Our Torah reading for this evening is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 9. In Hebrew, the name of the book is called Devorim. We'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 5 through 9, on page 201 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Look, I have taught you laws and rulings, just as Adonai my God ordered me, so that you can behave accordingly in the land where you are going in order to take possession of it. Therefore, observe them and follow them, for then all peoples will see you as having wisdom and understanding. When they hear of all these laws, they will say, This great nation is surely a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God as close to them as Adonai our God is? Whenever we call on him, what great nation is there that has laws and rulings as just as the entire Torah which I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourself diligently as long as you live, so that you won't forget what you saw with your own eyes, so that these things won't vanish from your hearts. Rather, make them known to your children and grandchildren. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, asher natam ana Torah temet, v'chayotam atam letechinu, Baruch atah Adonai, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. And now for the congregational response following the reading of the Torah. Asher Sam Moshe, Lifne Bene Israel, Aki Adonai, Beyad Moshe, Eschaim, Lemachazichimra, Letolcheya, Beusha. This is the Torah which Moses placed before the children of Israel. It is in accord with the Lord's command by the hand of Moses. A tree of life it is for those who take hold of it, and blessed are the ones who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Turn us, O Lord, to you, and let us return. Renew our days as of old. Now for the blessing before the reading of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose good prophets, delighting in their words, which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chose the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Amen. Our Haftarah portion for this evening is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. In Hebrew, the name of the book is Yeshiyahu Hanavi. We'll be reading from chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, page 495 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Comfort and keep comforting my people, says your God. Tell Jerusalem to take heart. Proclaim to her that she has completed her time of service, that her guilt has been paid off, and that she has received at the hand of Adonai double for all her sins. A voice cries out, 
clear a road through the desert for Adonai, level a highway in the Avra for our God. Let every valley be filled in, every mountain and hill lowered. The bumpy places made level and the crags become a plain. Then the glory of Adonai will be revealed. All humankind together will see it. For the mouth of Adonai has spoken. Amen. The blessing following the reading of the Haftorah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all ages, righteous throughout all generations. You are the faithful God, promising and then performing, first speaking, then fulfilling, for all your words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for no word of yours shall remain unfulfilled. You are a faithful and merciful God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who are faithful in fulfilling your words. Amen. Amen. And now the blessing before the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, Asher natan l'mashiach Yeshua, Baharim roshel harich ha'chadasha, Baruch atah Adonai, Notein harich ha'chadasha. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Our Brit HaKadoshah portion for tonight is Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Again, we'll be reading Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34 on page 1279 in the Complete Jewish Bible. the tree of life. One of the Torah scholars came and heard them debating. Seeing that Yeshua had answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is first of all? Yeshua answered, the first is Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the Torah scholar said to him, you have spoken the truth, that he is Echad, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love thy neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Yeshua saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God and no one dared any longer to question him. Amen. Now the blessing following the reading of the New Covenant Scriptures. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, Asher natah lehavar hamet, V'chai olam natah betachinu, Baruch atah Adonai, Notein habit hachadashah. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. When the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priest with righteousness. May those who have experienced your faithful love shout for joy. Hallelujah! For the sake of your servant David, please do not delay the return of your Messiah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gives us the living word in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. When the ark is closed, you may be seated.
please join me in reciting He being merciful. He being merciful forgives iniquity and does not destroy. Frequently he turns away his anger and does not stir up all his wrath. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving and exceedingly kind to all who call upon you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Yeshua, our Messiah, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. But first, uh, a reminder about the calendar. Uh, tonight begins the 11th day of the fifth month, uh, which is the month of Av. And that means that two days ago, it would have been the ninth of Av. The Uh, the rabbis have actually set it up so that this day does not take us by surprise. Uh, we start thinking about it three weeks in advance. Um, we start a time of uh, semi-morning beginning on the 17th day of the fourth month. Uh, and we also have three uh, special Haftarah portions that are chosen, which are referred to as the Haftarah of Affliction. Uh, and these are intended to remind the Jewish people uh, of why God may have indeed allowed the temples um, to be uh, destroyed. And uh, they actually come to a conclusion. They say it is because of Sinat Hinam, uh, which means baseless hatred. Uh, and of course, the antidote to Sinat uh, Hinam would be Sinat Ahava baseless or unconditional love. Uh, and that is reflected in the seven Haftarah portions uh, that are read following the ninth of Av, uh, referred to as the seven Haftarot of Consolation, uh, the first of which we read tonight. These uh, Haftarah portions are selected, as I mentioned, the first three remind us of perhaps why the Lord would allow the, temple to be the temples to be destroyed. These remind us of God's promises, his covenant promises of future blessings uh, that we will yet experience uh, as a people. And so, um, and that's why uh, tonight's Haftarah started out uh, with the words of comfort that we mentioned. Uh, the Jewish people are able to take comfort for the same reason that we as followers of Messiah take comfort today because we know that God is in charge. We know that he is able to use any plague, any pandemic to accomplish his purposes. He can reveal his faithfulness. He can reveal his goodness. He can reveal his mercy or his grace. Uh, he can reveal his power over every other power of this world. My God is able. My God can supply all our needs according to his riches and glory in Messiah Yeshua. And that is why we continue this night to seek truth, to seek guidance, to seek supernatural revelation for the challenges uh, that we face today. Uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, uh, we realize, Lord, that you are in charge and that uh, this world uh, it easily can cause us to become uh, frustrated and discouraged, uh, Lord, and the events that are taking place uh, do make life difficult for many, and we don't want to uh, downplay that. But, Lord, we know that our God is greater. Our God is stronger than any other. You are the one true God. You are the creator of the universe, and you are the God who uh, sent the plagues as a demonstration of your signs and wonders long ago to set our Jewish people free. And Lord, you are able to use these plagues tonight. Uh, th this plague that exists in our world today, you are able to use to set people free, to help them to realize uh, that there is more than the power of uh, man uh, taking place in this world today. Uh, that there is a God, there is a creator, there is a Holy One of Israel. And Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself in an unmistakable way 
to each person who is here tonight, to those who will watch later on the video, Lord, uh, as we seek your truth, as we seek comfort, uh, as we seek revelation for our lives today, as I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer, I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. To uh, kind of bring us up to date, last week we discussed the first portion of Devarim, or Deuteronomy, uh, which involved two primary uh, reminders of the Lord. Number one, he reminded the people of a time of faithlessness, uh, of a time when they listened to the bad report of the ten scouts. Uh, and as a result, they spent an additional uh, total of 40 years, uh, which was probably an additional 39 years and 10 months or so, of schlepping through the desert uh, with the family, with the animals, with the, the heat, with the, the enemies that would uh, come against them, uh, met great hardship that we read about and we're like, oh yeah, no big deal. You know, it, 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 um, they should have known. They should have listened to the right report. They should have uh, gone into the land when they were supposed to. And yet we have a little bit of inconvenience. From, while we sit in our air-conditioned houses and we drive to and from places in our air-conditioned cars, and, and it seems like the world is, is coming to an end. And that's certainly true in the world. But the Lord tells us that we are not to fear. We have nothing to fear. Even if the mountains were cast into the sea, as he says in Psalm 46, uh, we have nothing to fear because our God is in charge. Uh, the God who created us is the God who is sovereign over all. And the, the uh, laws of this universe are submitted to him. He can supernaturally suspend them uh, if he needs to. Uh, frequently, that's what we ask him to do when we go to him in prayer. Even when we ask him to, to heal us of a cold um, or when we pray on somebody's behalf, we're saying, Lord, if this isn't the way the natural laws of the universe are going, we are asking you to step in and intercede. You may not have realized that that is the faith that you were demonstrating every time we go to the Lord in prayer. You know, the world would limit us as to what we can pray for. If you want to pray for healing from a cold, that's fine. Uh, if you want to pray, you know, that somebody would be healed of a disease, that's okay. If there's a hurricane coming and you want to pray that that hurricane would turn, sorry, you've crossed the line somewhere, according to the world. At least that's what Pat Robertson found out uh, when he proclaimed that our God is able to turn the hurricane, to change the course. Uh, and, and, and do you believe that tonight? Uh, it, it, it is that faith. It is that belief that causes us to say, Lord, we are trusting in you, even in these difficult times. So the first reminder was the time of their faithfulness, but uh, faithlessness, the time of the children of Israel listening to the bad report. Are we listening to the bad report tonight? There are so many things that are being said out there. Are we seeking after truth? And are we seeking after eternal truth? And thank you, Lord, for giving us one day each week when we can forget about all that noise that's out there and turn our attention fully on his eternal truths. Then the second thing he reminded them was of their victory over two of the kings, the most powerful kings in the region, which was intended to show them that with the Lord on their side, they could be victorious no matter how powerful their enemies seemed, no matter how powerful the adversary seemed at the time. Therefore, they have no reason to fear as they go into the land, the land of promise, the land of hope, that when they cross over into that land, whatever challenges they may face, the same God who was on their side and defeated the most powerful kings in that region is able to bring them the victory. He is able to even go before them and drive out the inhabitants of the land. Now, it's not a free ride. He tells them if they do the same thing the inhabitants do, what happens? They will be scattered as well. And that is actually, uh, as we know, what ended up happening. But the story doesn't end there because we know what took place uh, in the 20th century, uh, not that long ago, perhaps even some of our lifetimes, probably not at this point. But anyway, 
uh, where Israel was reestablished as a nation, um, where the people were regathered from the four corners of the earth, where our God not only performed the miracle of reestablishing that nation, but is regathering his people and drawing them back to him, drawing them out of the four corners of the earth. And he may be calling and drawing you back to him tonight as well. Because just like the Jewish people, we too can be scattered. We can be scattered in our thinking. We can be scattered as we walk away from his truths. Uh, and we can see that uh, he is always calling us back. He is always waiting uh, with open arms. Because our God's uh, love and mercy is greater than anything that we could do uh, in rebellion against his ways. Now, that, that doesn't mean that the adversary isn't going to get into the act in these situations. Uh, for example, he is taking a miracle of the Lord of bringing the Jewish people back to their land. After thousands of years, it didn't seem possible. Uh, the land had become a wasteland. Uh, the Jewish people were not only scattered but persecuted just about everywhere they went. And yet there were all these prophecies that one day they would be back in the land. Uh, that, that we would say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Who would know that the Jewish people would have to be told, behold your God. But the reality is they are dwelling back in the land of Judah. And we bring a message of behold your God who has revealed himself through the one who brings reconciliation, Messiah Yeshua. But the enemy would have this, this miracle be seen as something uh, that is not an example of God's faithfulness, but rather is a reason by the world to question God's faithfulness, to raise uh, questions as to whether or not the Jewish people rightfully belong in the land. I think a, a um, I can't think of his name, oh, Seth Rogen. Okay, I thought of his name. Don't want to drop any names, but uh, he has been ruminating this past week uh, on a Mark Marin podcast, according to my uh, information on my news feed. Gosh, I almost sound like a young person. It's scary. <laughs> anyway, um, about whether or not Israel uh, had the right to take the land that belonged to the Palestinians. And the reality is, uh, as uh, people have pointed out in response, long before the current Palestinians ever thought of being in that land, Jerusalem was under the control of the Jewish people. And so our God is a restoring God, but the world, the adversary, Hasatan, will constantly question uh, not only our Jewish people's right to the land, uh, but even perhaps if they could permanently be expelled from the land, then he is questioning the very promises of God. Because God would be guilty of failing to keep his promises. He said that he would bring them back into the land. And in, uh, I believe it's Amos chapter 9, he says, they will no more be uprooted. So we can have confidence that our God is more powerful than this plague. Just by looking at the map. And, and back in the day when uh, we didn't look at maps on our phone, but they were actually on a piece of paper that, that you would look at, Israel was like smack dab in the middle. It was tiny, but right in the middle where, where you couldn't miss the fact that God remains faithful uh, to his promises to the Jewish people. Does anybody know what land the Jewish people were offered as a homeland in 1903? Part of Kenya was offered uh, to the Jewish people as a place of refuge from Russian czarist pogroms. But the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish dream remained the land promised in scripture. The land promised to their forefathers, three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you'll have to figure out who the fourth one is. No, that's a joke. Forefathers meaning ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this land would be given back to the Jewish people in the Balfour Declaration in 1917, following World War I, as a, a demonstration of appreciation for their uh, assistance in actually winning that war. And 30 years later, the Jewish people accepted a United Nations resolution, giving them a much smaller amount of land for a homeland that didn't even include Jerusalem, but God remains faithful to his promises. And the Jewish people 
regain control of Jerusalem in the Six Day War in 1967. This week's Torah portion is called Va'et Kanan. It begins in Deuteronomy 3, verse 23. Va'et Kanan means, and I pleaded. And who is doing the pleading? This is Moses pleading with the Lord to allow him to enter the land of promise. We don't always get what we want. Uh, even the, the greatest intercessor that the Jewish people had ever seen up to that time, the one who led them out of slavery in Egypt uh, because of the moment when he uh, struck the rock in anger that one time, the Lord refuses to listen to his pleading. Uh, and as a result, it will not be Moses, but it will be Joshua who will lead the children of Israel across the Jordan into the land of promise. Now, another reason for God not to allow Moses to lead the people into the land is that they might have attributed this accomplishment to Moses. The choosing of Joshua reminds us that God's promises are not dependent on any one particular individual. The scriptures also reveal that Moses would eventually set foot in the land, though it will be several thousand years later. Uh, in Matthew 17, verse 1, Yeshua takes Kepha, Peter, Yaakov, James, and Yochanan, John, to a high uh, mountain, and soon they notice that Yeshua's face shines like the sun, and his clothes have all become like light. And then they see Eliyahu, Hanavi, and another figure which ends up being underlined on the slide so that you won't miss that it is Moses who is not only in the land, but Peter offers to make shelters for them, uh, a place of dwelling, so Moses will finally be able uh, to dwell in the land. We often mention that the book of Deuteronomy is written in the form of a treaty of that time called a suzerainty treaty. Uh, executed between a conquering suzerain uh, or king, as we have pointed out in the past, who is the, the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who's uh, over the whole thing, uh, the, the one who uh, we used to sing when we were little, right? He's got the whole world in his hands. We're talking the king of the universe, okay? And his conquered vassals who are the Israelites, and by extension, us as well. Okay, we'll have to work on the next quiz and see how we do on that. <laughs> the first three chapters of Devarim contain two introductory parts, the preamble and the historical prologue. And in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, Devarim, we come to the portion of the suzerainty treaty known as the stipulations, uh, where the requirements of the conquered people are specified. Deuteronomy 4 verse 1 starts out, and now Israel, listen, the Hebrew is Shema. Twenty times we find the Hebrew root of Shema, to hear or listen or hearken in chapters 4 and 5. You may not see this in English translations, but it's very clear uh, in the Hebrew that the message is that we need to listen, we need to hear, actually, uh, and, and then we need to obey. That's uh, why I like the term hearken. It has the idea of not only hearing, but also carrying out. <coughs> hearken to the statutes and rulings I am teaching you. Why? So that you may follow them. His people are expected to live a certain way based on his truths. The people are told that obeying these instructions will bring life. And it also says in Deuteronomy 4 verse 1, then you will go in and take possession of the land that Adonai, the God of your fathers, is giving you. So who was the land given to? Uh, in Bereshi, Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15. God gave the land to Abraham and his descendants forever. Will the land always belong to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Okay, we're doing better on the quizzes here. See, I knew we'd get the next one. Will they always be dwelling in it? No. Not necessarily. As we find in Deuteronomy 4, verse 26, it's predicted right here that when they've lived a long time in the land and then they make idols, the Lord tells them that they will be scattered 
and quickly disappear from the land that they are crossing the Jordan to possess. Today, the Jewish people are returning from that scattering. And you can make sure that the adversary, the enemy, doesn't like it. And he is doing all he can to keep up the pressure on God's people. Israel is constantly under pressure to even give away uh, parts of the land that God has given them. Uh, in, in a battle where often they were attacked uh, and in a defensive battle. Uh, posture and, and, and starting out defending themselves and then going on the offensive, they were actually uh, able to uh, obtain more land than they had before the battle began to the point that their enemies no longer seek to wage that kind of war against them. After a while, you figure, hey, every time we attack, they end up with more land. What's wrong with this picture? Maybe we need to stop attacking. So instead, they've gone to terrorist attacks to try and torment the Jewish people, and they've gone to propaganda attacks, to attack them uh, verbally, to attack them as uh, being occupiers and oppressors, uh, when nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, that, that the Jewish people, it is the only democratic nation in the entire Middle East. Uh, that it, Not only are they um, a land of democracy and do the people enjoy more freedoms in that land, than any other land in the region, but they constantly reach out to help the surrounding nations, often their enemies. Uh, they, they will take care in their hospitals of the children of terrorists that sought to blow up their own children. Uh, and yet so often they are vilified and we have to realize that is because there is a supernatural battle uh, going on. And as we hear truths, as we read the scriptures, as we see God's words of condemnation and chastisement that are often used to suggest that the people are uh, not treating others right and that they don't belong in the land and that they haven't been faithful, what do we need to do? Keep reading. Because every time you read a passage about chastisement, if you keep reading, you will see that the purpose is to draw the people back to God because he will always remain faithful. Uh, let's see where I am. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the second stipulation found in uh, this week's portion is that the Israelites are not to add to the statutes and judgments, nor take away from them, as we read in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. So the question is, can the vassals uh, change the instructions of the king? And the answer is no. They're just to uh, accept them as he provides them as he tells them what blessings will go along with their obedience uh, to the stipulations. That's why the message is entitled, Multiplying is Good, but Adding, Subtracting, or Dividing is Bad. And, and you know, you would think it would be pretty obvious that, that we humans should not be changing the instructions of the king of the universe. You might think that. I mean, you might think that we would not be able to improve upon his instructions. But both the Jewish people and many in the believing world have done just that. The Jewish people have created additional requirements through the interpretations of the rabbis. For example, separate dishes for milk and meat. That requirement is not found in the scriptures. Uh, but, uh, and, and perhaps... Uh, you can think of some examples in, in churches that you may have uh, been to in the past or, um, you know, hopefully not here. But some churches do not permit drinking alcohol. Some do not permit dancing or musical instruments. Uh, it, you know, we find these uh, things talked about in the scriptures and there are no prohibitions uh, against uh, dancing or using musical uh, instruments in terms of banning them entirely. Now, you know, you don't necessarily want musical instruments going off in the middle of a message. There are certain restrictions, and really, frequently, that's what it comes down to is how do we interpret the instructions that God has given us? That's not uh, always as easy as we would like it to be. But nonetheless, uh, that does not suggest that we should take away uh, from the requirements. Uh, or, or add to the requirements, but taking away is also a problem. Uh, once again, both in Judaism and in the church, uh, as they 
see these um, instructions as no longer applicable in our world today. I grew up Reformed Jewish, one of the liberal uh, branches of Judaism, and most Reformed Jews, uh, including my rabbi at the time, do not treat the dietary laws of the Torah as if they are relevant today. Uh, and I don't have to tell you that many in the church have concluded that not just the dietary laws, but all of the law is no longer applicable, despite Yeshua saying in Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, and I put it up there in the King James so you will know, whenever I read a passage that is favorable towards the Jewish people, I tend to not use Jewish translation so you'll know, no, this is what it actually says. Yeshua said, it's in red letters if, uh, in Bibles that have Yeshua's words in red letters, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Uh, what does that mean? What does fulfill mean? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Till heaven and earth pass. Uh, last time I looked, the heavens were up there. And I think the earth is still here too. Um, not the smallest letter or the smallest stroke. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all of it is fulfilled. Now, some people argue, oh, okay, Messiah came and he came to uh, fulfill it. Well, here's my question to that um, understanding is, do you believe he's coming back? Yeah. That means it hasn't all yet been fulfilled. So theologically, now we need to take the position of, okay, how do we understand this? How do we apply this uh, in our lives today? What do these truths reveal to us? And, and our Jewish people, their approach towards Torah, not necessarily the reform, but the conservative and the orthodox, is whenever we cannot obey an instruction completely, we obey it as best we can. And, and that, that's a reality that um, we can experience the Lord's blessing as we seek a greater understanding, sometimes just by doing things out of obedience. Uh, you know, there's a certain um, servant attitude when we just say, okay, Lord, I don't have to understand the reason for everything. If I'm able to do this today, then I will try and do it. And I will trust that you will help me to understand in a better way why you have given me these instructions. Because it's been my experience that when we remove God's requirements, man-made requirements tend to fill in the gap. One reason many in the church take away from God's revelation is because they do not have a good understanding of the importance of works in the life of the believer. They just say it's all about grace. But as we're showing in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then the next verse talks about works. It says, we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua unto good works, which God hath ordained. God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so, yes, there is great blessing in understanding his grace his unmerited favor, favor from him that we don't deserve, blessings that we don't deserve. But that doesn't mean that we can live any way we want. He has given us instructions for a purpose, and we desire to understand the, that purpose. We study that purpose so that when we are living in difficult times, we may very well get a revelation from the Lord during our time in his word that says, hey, this is for me right now to deal with this challenge that I am facing. Uh, and I think we would all agree that uh, between the pandemic and the unrest in our nation and the political uh, disputes that are taking place, disagreements, whatever uh, nice word you want for the uh, phrase that both parties are at each other's throat basically and can't agree on anything, um, those are the days we are living in. But our people have endured much worse and God remains faithful. He will provide a way uh, to escape the challenges that this world may throw at us. He will sustain us through the challenge um, so that we are able to bear it. We trust in him instead of man-made uh, requirements. 
uh, because his truths are eternal. In Deuteronomy chapter five, we, five, we find a repetition of the 10 words uh, is what it says in the Hebrew, referred to as the 10 commandments that the people received from the Lord through Moses at Mount Sinai, uh, here referred to as Horeb. The Israelites knew that their works were to be a demonstration of their faith, uh, that, that the two go hand in hand. Uh, it, it's not grace and no works, and it's not all works and no grace because our works are meaningless unless they are tied to the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua in our life that brings forgiveness for our sin and a restored relationship with the creator of the universe. Three times our Jewish people said uh, that all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Uh, those are in Exodus 19 verse 8, Exodus 24 verse 3, and Exodus 24 verse 7. Uh, whenever something was done three times, it was like an additional confirmation. And so the Jewish people, three different times, in three different ways, when they received these instructions from the Lord, they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And it's easy to start out with good intentions, but are we able to carry it through? Or the minute a challenge comes our way, do we say, that's okay, Lord. I can handle this on my own. I don't think you can handle it anyway. And boom, we go about just making things worse. Or do we, uh, you know, just the, the temptation comes along and it's like, well, I know I said that back then, but I didn't know this was going to come along, you know, and Lord, just help us in the trial. Help us to overcome the temptation. Help us to trust in you in all of our ways and lean not on our own understandings that you might uh, direct our paths. Verses 4 through 9 of Deuteronomy 6 summarize the Lord's instructions to his people. Uh, I talked about this earlier in the Shema and the Via Hafta prayers uh, that are recited uh, in the synagogue in every service uh, and that we recite on Friday nights. The name of these prayers come from the first Hebrew word in the prayer. The Shema is a community proclamation of the Lord's oneness to the Israelite community. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 says, Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is our God, Eloheinu in the Hebrew, the God of all of us. This is a communal prayer. He is the God of the entire community. The Hebrew word for one here is echad, as you know, because we sang it earlier and it was emphasized in the uh, uh, New Covenant reading, I think. Uh, no, I guess it was in the um, Torah reading. Uh, it means a composite unity consistent with the triune God that we find in Isaiah 48, verse 16, uh, which speaks of a creator and his spirit. And the, actually, for creator, it says Lord God, and then the one who has not spoken in secret uh, from the beginning. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that, uh, you know, we proclaim his oneness, but we realize that the Hebrew scriptures support the idea that it is a composite oneness. Uh, as I point out to my bar mitzvah class, Genesis 1.1 says, uh, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. And then Genesis 1-2, the very next verse says, Varuach Elohim, and the Spirit of God, uh, which are just two uh, different aspects of the triune nature of God. And um, here in Isaiah 48, verse 16, in Isaiah, it talks about the suffering servant. It talks about God having a son in Proverbs 30, verse 4. It talks about a child being born uh, uh, to a uh, maiden. Uh, a, a, a young maiden, a, a Alma in the Hebrew, a, a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14, um, who, we be, who would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, we, we see these aspects of the triune nature of God, not in the New Covenant Scriptures, so it's surely to be found there, but in the Hebrew Scriptures as well. God is one. It also suggests that he is unique. He is different than every other God. And there are other gods out there. There are even, there, today there's the, the God of Islam, uh, Allah, and our God is greater. Uh, the nations that were around the Israelites were polytheistic pagan nations. Polytheistic meaning they had many gods. 
Uh, one God was the sun God. Another God was the rain God. Uh, another was the God of thunder. They had gods of war, of the harvest, of wisdom, of love. And you did all you could to keep these gods happy because they were looking down and they might destroy you for uh, doing anything that might cause them uh, to feel like you deserved it in any way. And uh, so you were really concerned about being destroyed just at a moment's notice. Uh, but what we realize is that our God is greater. Our God is stronger because our God is all of these rolled into one. And not only is he not looking down to destroy you, he wants an intimate relationship with his creation. Uh, he is the creator of the universe, but he offered up his son as a demonstration of his unconditional love towards each and every one of us. His love for us, his, his desire for a relationship with us is not to be motivated by a fear of punishment unless we go so far astray that that's the only thing that will bring us back. But he desires a relationship with us that is based on love and trust. Unlike the Shema, the Via Hafta is directed to each individual Israelite, as we recited earlier, Via Hafta Eit Adonai Elohecha, and thou, you as an individual, uh, shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And the reason I emphasize the thys and the thous is because that is a singular uh, in the Hebrew. And it's singular in the King James translation, but some translations just say you. And you can't tell whether the word you in English, it can either mean you singular or you, you plural. But in the Shema, it talked about our God Eloheinu, the next verse. So this is no accident, is now talking about you, meaning the individual. Uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And these words shall be where? on your heart, right? Um, God wants his words. What, what does it mean to be on our heart? It is to be part of our core existence. It is to be part of what motivates us. And this is actually part of the promise of the Brit Kadashah, the new covenant made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, in Jeremiah 31 verse uh, 33, the Lord says um, that he will uh, place Torah T, my Torah, uh, in your inward parts, and it will be written where? Upon the heart, once again. We are to teach these words diligently to our children, to speak of them all throughout the day. When we're walking about, lying down or rising up, we're to be continuously living for the Lord so that our children will see an example of faithfulness and obedience in our lives. He wants us to teach them how much God loves them and to help them understand the blessings of being obedient to our loving Heavenly Father. Now, unfortunately, that's easier said than done, isn't it? But that's, that's the challenge we have. We say it every time we meet to remind us of its importances, uh, importance in our lives, in the life of our family, uh, in, in, in our future. You know, our, our future is actually the future generations, our children and, and our grandchildren. And whether or not we are living out God's truths can make a tremendous difference in their lives. We may not see it right at the moment. It may be 10, 15, 20 years before we really uh, see these effects. But frequently, seeds that we sow now will bear much fruit later on. And seeds that we fail to sow won't bear any fruit later on. you got to sow the seed. There are places where the Word of God is to be uh, understood. Uh, uh, the, uh, let's see. The word of God, it, we're to place it on our heart, but it also says um, that the word of God is to be placed in other places, and the Jewish people take these instructions literally. Some put on the tefillin or phylacteries. Um, uh, there's a picture of an Israeli soldier wearing the phylacteries. Um, as they bind them upon their hands and have them as frontlets uh, between their eyes. Uh, they're also written on the doorposts of our houses in the mezuzah, which means doorposts. Uh, we have mezuzahs on the entrances to this building, uh, and many of us have them in our homes. Uh, we sell them in our gift shop if you're interested uh, in, in getting one. So the Jewish people, when it says these words are, are to be written upon the doorposts of thy house, they have this uh, object 
which actually contains these words inside it that they literally place uh, on the doorposts of the house. You know, sometimes uh, we can be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. And there's a lot to be said for actually uh, seeking to incorporate these truths literally. But frequently, in addition to the literal understanding, there's also spiritual truths that uh, we can glean as well. When Yeshua was asked what is the greatest commandment, he quotes the Shema and the Viahavta in his response, as Rosalie read earlier from Mark chapter 12, verse 29, uh, which says, Hear, O Israel, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in the description of this incident in Matthew, um, Yeshua sums things up saying, on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. Is it a challenge to just follow those two commandments? I would suggest that if we would love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and might, there would be no divorce between believers. There would be no estrangement in believing families. There would be no conflict amongst believers. There would be no discord, no division in Messianic synagogues. Looks like we still have some work to do, doesn't it? In the last part of the Torah portion in Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 through 9, we find out why the Jewish people are called the chosen people. It's not because of their great numbers, for they were the fewest of all peoples. They were chosen because of God's love and because he wanted to keep the promises that he had made to our forefathers. In other words, God wants the world to see the Jewish people as a demonstration of his faithfulness, as we uh, read earlier in um, was it in Isaiah? Yeah, I think it was in, in um, it, it was either, yeah, I think it was in Isaiah. Um, that, that not only is he faithful to the promises that he has made to our forefathers, but also he wants the world to see uh, an example in the Jewish people that God is a promise-keeping God, yeah. that he will bless uh, his people when they uh, are following his ways. Uh, which brings us to the Haftarah portion for this week. Uh, in closing, Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 26. Actually, in Isaiah 39, Isaiah has predicted the Babylonian captivity. But the words of Isaiah 40 suggest that God is in charge. He is using Babylon to chastise his people, but he also provides comfort to the Jewish people that they would at some point in the future dwell once again in Jerusalem. I mean, realize when your temple's been destroyed, when you've been taken into exile in a foreign land where you're commanded to serve foreign gods or else you get to go uh, have a pet lion. Uh, well, maybe not a pet. You get to spend some time uh, with the lions in, in their den. Um, you, you're wondering, you know, what, has be, what will become of us? Uh, and, and we've actually seen uh, the fulfillment of this in terms of the return from the Babylonian exile. And also, as I mentioned earlier, in 1967, where the Jewish people are once again able to dwell in Jerusalem. But the ultimate fulfillment will come after Messiah's return. Isaiah 40, verse 1, starts out with words of consolation. Nakamu, nakamu ami. Uh, as we sang earlier, comfort my people. And the doubling of the Hebrew, nakamu, puts extra emphasis on this covering, co uh, comforting. And the u ending is actually a command. Uh, it's an imperative. It is telling others that they are to comfort God's people. Uh, Jerusalem is receiving double words of consolation just as re she's received double punishment for all of her sins, as it says in verse 2. Is this fair? Well, first of all, which one? Is the double blessing fair or the double punishment? It doesn't matter because Israel is described as the Lord's firstborn in Exodus 4, verse 22. And as such... They are entitled to the double blessing of the firstborn. But as we see here, when they go astray as the firstborn, they also receive double punishment. In verse 5, we see that the glory of the Lord will be revealed through the Jewish people as a testimony to the world. All flesh shall see it, uh, that the good news will be described. In verse 10, the Lord will come with power. His arm will rule with him and his reward is with him. These terms are understood to be descriptions of the Messiah as deliverer. The cities of Judah will be told their God is here. And how will they respond? They will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As it, uh, 
Yeshua described it in Matthew 23, verse 39, that he would not return until our Jewish people said, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Haftarah portion ends in Isaiah 40, verse 26, with Isaiah telling Israel, lift up your eyes to the heavens, and when they look into the sky, they will see the arranging of the stars, which Isaiah says the Lord has power over. He created them. He gave each one of them a name. Uh, we're, we're also told to look up in Luke 21, verses 27 and 28, as we're told that a battle will take place over Jerusalem after the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. And that is when we are to look up for our redemption draws near. Let not our hearts be troubled as the day grows darker, for our light will grow brighter as our redemption draws near. May we experience shalom, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, the restoring power of God, as we learn to trust in our Creator. Even in a greater way, during these challenging times, we continue to trust in the Holy One of Israel. And Lord, I pray that we would understand your math, that we would experience multiplication of blessings in our lives while we avoid division in our community, that we would not add to or subtract from your revelation to us, that you would receive the glory and that you would be demonstrated as true even if every man is shown to be a liar. Let us just go to the Lord in prayer. Maybe someone's here tonight and you didn't know that God relates to us through these covenants that demonstrate his love for us. And you can receive his love tonight by accepting the provision of his son as a sacrifice for your sins. It's the only way we can experience forgiveness. We can't be good enough by our own efforts. And when our sins are forgiven, then we are able to have restored fellowship with the creator of the universe so that we might be able to look up knowing that our redemption is drawing near. So with every head bowed in prayer and every eye closed, would you just raise your hand if you've never done this before, but you want to say yes to the love of God tonight and receive Yeshua as your Messiah, as forgiveness for your sins, is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. Uh, but now there may be uh, the rest of us who have, uh, most of us, if not all, who have accepted Yeshua as our Messiah. Perhaps you've been adding to or taking away from God's revelation uh, without intending to, perhaps. Uh, you know, you might have your own definition of what it means to live for him. But you now realize that we are called to live according to his instructions and that he can reveal through the community, through his revelation, how that would even be carried out today. Or maybe you didn't realize that God would judge us based on our works, uh, that it's not just all about grace and mercy, but that we are supposed to be living for him. That one day our heavenly rewards will be based on what we have done in this life. And so, um, you know, and, and it's also possible that we get, go the other way and get caught up in the trap of legalism. Uh, where um, we feel like we're just doing things to be seen as, um, it, it, because we feel we have to, not because we want to. Or maybe you've come to see that you really haven't been loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, and might. That, uh, you know, we need his Torah written on our hearts so that all of our relationships would be a blessing, would be an opportunity to demonstrate the same unconditional love that we've been shown. So no matter how much people react a certain way to us, our desire is to bless them. That would cause our anger issues to greatly improve we will be much quicker to apologize and much slower to offend. Or, you know, the Lord may have shown you someone you've offended, and now you realize that there is a need to get right with that person. Maybe you doubted God's faithfulness in some area. As I pointed out, uh, we just see over and over in the scriptures demonstrations of God's faithfulness. Or maybe you've been going through a rough time, uh, and you need the Lord's comfort tonight. You know, as, as a community, we're not all going to be uh, walking in victory at the same time. And so we can offer words of encouragement. Those who are going through a difficult time, perhaps we went through the same thing before. If you feel the Lord speaking to you in one of these areas, or perhaps even some other area, the way I like to do it is I just ask you to raise your hand, which is just uh, you taking a concrete action so that there will be no doubt later that you've made this commitment to the Lord. 
So just raise your hand right now as a sign of your commitment to him. I'm not even going to uh, worry about who's raising their hands. That's just between you and the Lord. As Lord, we ask you in the name of Yeshua to speak by your Ruach, by your spirit, to those here who uh, have committed to making changes that you would have them to make. Lord, I ask you to provide shalom uh, in our congregation. I ask you to make families whole, to bring about reconciliation and restoration. Lord, I pray that we would represent you to those that you would bring into uh, our lives in the days ahead, that the truth of, your, truth of your love would be manifest in our lives, that we would be willing vessels to say to you tonight, not our will, but your will be done, that we desire to be uh, vessels used for your purposes that would bring glory to you in the coming week. And we ask these things in the name of our Messiah Yeshua. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. I hope that um, if you feel encouragement uh, from the, these messages or even from other things that are going on in your life, perhaps your t time of meditating in the word, um, share that with others. There are a lot of people who are struggling uh, for various reasons at this time. And you really uh, can take advantage of an opportunity uh, to just be a blessing in their life. There doesn't have to be any other motivation other than um, to be a blessing. The Lord will do the rest. At this time, I'm going to call up our cantor as we are going to pronounce the traditional Sabbath blessings over the fruit of the vine and the bread, uh, known as the Kiddush and the Hamotzi, and then we will have a... Um, pronounce a blessing over you and have our closing song. Uh, the Kiddush comes from the same Hebrew root as Kadosh, which means holy as we set apart the service unto the Lord. And in the Hamotzi, we thank him for his provision. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. 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 And we say L'chaim because that's a traditional Jewish toast that means to life. As the Lord tells us, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you may live. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alam, hamozi lechem hem haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread and all manner of food from the earth. Amen. 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 Thank you, Fred. And now I'm going to ask everyone to please stand as we are going to pronounce the blessing found in Numbers chapter 6. Uh, as we mentioned, Aharon was designated to be the first Kohen Gadol, the first high priest, and he was told to pronounce these words of blessing uh, over God's people. These words are found in Numbers 6, uh, verses 24 through 26, and we encourage you to receive these words of blessing from the Lord this evening. Ya er adonai panav alecha vechunecha Ya sarunai panav alecha ve yasim lecha shalom The Lord bless you and keep you The Lord calls his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, and may he grant unto you his peace. Amen. Amen. And now we'll have our closing song. It's the Ankel Ohenu. They sing it in Hebrew in the synagogue. We'll sing it in Hebrew, and then we'll sing it in English, so you'll know what you've just sung. And Kelohenu means, there is no one like our God. Sing it like you mean it. En Kelohenu, en Kadonenu, en Kamohenu, en Kamoshienu, mi Kelohenu, mi Kelohenu.
And now the English translation. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our Lord. There is no one like our King. There is no one like our Messiah. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Messiah? We give thanks to our God. We give thanks to our Lord. We give thanks to our King. We give thanks to our Messiah. Blessed be our God. Blessed be our Lord. Blessed be our King. Blessed be our Messiah. You are the one, our God. You are the one, our Lord. You are the one, our King. You are the one, our Messiah. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Remember the social distancing.